kind of bringing it to an end um, this morning. And as we do, we're looking at that little sweet spot that's there in the middle. Um, the remain in me. You see, as, as Christians, that should be our goal to remain in Christ. It's not a... Um, it's not something mystical, it's not something that's difficult, but yet it's something that each one of us should have a passion and a desire for. Yet, let's be honest, it seems to elude us a lot of times. We struggle with it. And so this morning, as we talk about this and look at, at what God has for us, I want us to see the, that remaining in Christ is not something mystical. It's something that's obtainable and that we can all do. And ultimately, it depends upon Christ himself. But yet, we bear responsibility in it. You know, our, our call to, as a church, and our mission is set by our Savior, our King, our General, our, um, our Sovereign. And it's simple. You know, Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you even to the end of the age. Because this is our command, is to go and make disciples. And as we've looked at each one of those areas to, to connect, to, to, to grow, to serve, We've tied them directly to the steps that Jesus asked his disciples to take. That's why it's just been in broad strokes that I've painted this. Because we don't live, you know, 2,000 years ago in the Middle East and, and it, our culture is different, our time is different. But yet those same steps are the same steps that every generation has been called to take. And we're coming to the final step, the command that Christ gave us. And, and if you look at, uh, on the screen or if you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 15. This is one of my favorite portions of Scripture. It's the, I, I love this. I mean, put yourself in this place. Jesus knows his time has come to an end. He knows that his life is going to be taken from him. He's knelt and washed the disciples' feet. He has taken the last supper with them. He is now headed towards the garden where he knows he's going to be betrayed. Where he knows that Judas is going to come and he's going to be let off to be crucified. He's, I mean, Intentionally, not that he would ever do anything unintentionally, but like a laser beam, he is teaching his disciples some final things. Last week it was, listen, I washed your feet, you wash, you wash each other's feet, and if you do this, you'll be blessed. Right now, we pick the story up as he walks towards Gethsemane. And he's walking through a vineyard. And I can see him stopping at a grapevine at a, and, and using it as an illustration. I mean, I come from the land of fruits and nuts, okay? All right, I, I won't lie to you. Yeah, I know where California is. I know it well, okay? And one of the things you learn is, you know, right now there's a boom in, in wineries popping up everywhere, where we used to run cows, now they're, they can make more money on grapes. I mean, they're everywhere. And I can see Jesus using a familiar illustration for them. And he says this, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes every branch that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more fruit. You have, all, you have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. 
For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch that withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great joy to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obeyed my Father's commandments and remained in His love, I have told you these things so that you would be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love one another in the same way that I have loved you. I mean, it's a familiar illustration. And Jesus is, is giving us this command to remain in Christ. That's why those matrix, that, that process that we have there, that's the center spot. That's the spot we all want to be in. That we're remaining in Christ and we're producing fruit and, and our jo- we have joy and we're resting in His love and our fruit remains and our Father's pleased. If we look in verse 15, it's, uh, or chapter 15 there in verse 5 and, and 7 and 8, it says, Jesus says this, Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me or abide in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. But if you remain or abide in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, for this brings great joy, or brings great glory to my Father. Let's say, I'm going to ask a tough question, and please don't raise your hand. How many of us, I know I do, I can you know, tell my story, not your story, but feel like, man, sometimes I just don't produce fruit that brings glory to my Father. I'm not remaining in Christ because, listen, he says, if I remain in him, if I abide in him, the net, the, 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 at the end of the day, I will have produced fruit. You know, the exhortation to abide or to remain, like I said earlier, sometimes seems mystical or seems so hard to grasp and, and to, to hold on to. But yet Jesus gives us some clear... Um, gives us a clear path on how to abide. Listen, it's not mystical. It's not something that, that you have to strive for. I mean, we have to strive for, but something that, that's out there that you can't grasp or hold on to or remain in Him. You know, the first thing that we need to understand is that our union with our Lord, with Christ, depends purely and solely upon His grace. It's His grace Ephesians, 4, or Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, But God being rich in mercy because of His great love which He has loved us, even when we are dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with Him and seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show His surpassing riches and His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is his gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are saved by grace through faith. Faith. Our faith actively accepting and believing and the free gift that's offered through Jesus Christ. Listen, I, I, I love you all, okay? Some of you I have yet to get to know. Some of you I've known for years and years. But listen, not one of us deserved the grace that was given us, the mercy that was shown us, okay? He died for a bunch of sinners like you and me. It's amazing. That Christ would die for me. But listen, our faith that we have is also active. Faith is active. 
It's always connected personally and united with Christ's activity. Too often we think that faith is passive. Faith is active. When we read the, the, the great chapter of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, it says it's impossible to please God without faith. Then it goes on to list the saints that are there. Not one of them sat on their hands and did nothing. Every one of them believed God and took action. Faith is not something that's just, that's just passive. It's actually rooted in the activity of God. It's rooted in the redemptive purpose that God has for this world and that He used Christ to redeem the world. We're entering into Christ and His mission. James says, but some, someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. Listen, folks, people should be able to see our faith in action. They should see us changing and growing and becoming like Christ. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for beforehand so that we would walk in them or do them. You see, our faith is active. It is not passive. Because see, we're grafted into the vine. We're grafted into the true vine. We're grafted into Christ. God is that vine dresser. <laughs> We don't see it in, in, in Montana, okay? But coming, like say, coming from the land of fruits and nuts, okay? Listen, my, my hometown, um, and I have to pronounce it correctly so you guys won't be confused, okay? I grew up with almonds, okay? Anybody else grow up with almonds? Okay? One other California kid, okay? He knows what an almond is. How many of you know what an almond is? Okay, my, my hometown is covered up in almonds and in vineyards right now. If you take an almond off of a tree and plant it in the ground and it grows up, okay, you can't eat the fruit that it produces. It's bitter, it's nasty, it's just, it's horrible. But they take that same wild almond and graft it in, and I believe it's a peach that they graft it to. It produces the almonds that we love and eat and cook with. The same thing with every tree that I know, uh, walnuts, okay? How many like walnuts? Anybody besides me? Okay. All right, black walnuts, okay, aren't the best eating walnut. They're very strong flavored walnut. So what we eat typically are called English walnuts, okay, that are grafted into a black walnut that they would produce good fruit because English walnut in and of itself isn't good to eat. It's kind of mushy and nasty. Let me ask, how many of us in here in our flesh can produce good fruit? Not one of us, guys. The Bible tells us that the fruit that we produce in our flesh is nothing but filthy rags before God. Because see, if we could, we could boast. We could say, God needs me. But no, He takes us, a wild branch, and grafts us into the true branch. Romans tells us, but if, someone, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive, are grafted among them, and became a partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. See, we're grafted in to the rich root, the one that, that by which we can bear fruit, that is good fruit. See, it, what it comes down to, it comes down to one single word if we're going to produce fruit in our lives. Jesus. One single person. Jesus. We're grafted into Him. He makes us fit to produce this fruit that we're commanded to produce. He's the only in and through Him can we produce that fruit 
that God demands us to produce. It comes down to Jesus and himself working in us. So if we're going to produce fruit, let me ask, do you know Jesus? Personally and intimately. Because without him, we can't produce that fruit. We cannot abide in him. Second, our union with Christ means being obedient. This is where we tend to go off the rails, okay? Because the, the church, unfortunately, has made obedience about keeping rules and regulations instead of obedience about love. In verse 15 of John 14, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You'll keep my commandments. Abiding involves our response to the teachings of Jesus. Abide in me, and my words abide in you. Abiding, being obedient. Paul echoes this same idea in, in Colossians uh, 3.16, where he writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. A statement that is directly connected to Ephesians 5.18, where Paul again says, be filled with the Spirit. You see, the Word of God united with the Spirit of God will bring about the things of God, the character of Christ in our life. In a nutshell, you know, abiding in Christ means allowing the Word of God to fill our lives, to fill our minds, to direct our wills. And to transform our characters and our affections into those of Christ himself. It's us becoming like Christ. In other words, our relationship to Christ is intimately connected to what you do with your Bible. One of the reasons I have us reading through the New Testament together. That it would encourage us to live it out and to be who he's called us. That it would wash us and purify us. But on Friday, she read Mary and Martha. Now listen, my wife read that probably a thousand times, the story of Mary and Martha at dinner with Jesus. And she said, you know what? After reading this, I really realized I'm Martha. I'm a doer. And listen, she's read it over and over and over but it really meant something to her. You see, what she does with it now, listen, determines the abide side of it. As Christians, you know, listen, the Word dwells in us and the Spirit fills us. We will begin to pray and act and truly become like Christ. Listen, when Jesus said this in John 15, 7, you will ask, what you desire and it shall be done for you. That was in the context of us taking on the character of Christ, the heart and the mind of Christ. Listen, if we want to see our prayers answered, we need to pray the right prayers. Not the right words, but pray the things that Jesus would pray for. Ask for the things Jesus would ask for. That's what it means to abide. The third thing that we need to understand is, is Christ underlines this principle simply when he says, abide in my love. We have to abide in his love. This states very clearly and applies to all believers that we need to rest in the arms of Jesus. Listen, I'm a Martha. I'm a doer. I'm a goer. You know, as I look at that matrix, you know, I can connect good. I, I grow. I serve. Okay? I do those things. But I don't rest in Jesus a lot. I tend to let my anxiety come up and why I'm awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. This is the lesson I need to learn. He says, abide in my love. I would tell you this, and now I'm telling myself this. If I can trust him with my eternal soul, can I not trust him with the decisions I need to make tomorrow and the things that will happen? See, I need to rest in his love. See, God's love for us, guys, isn't conditional. 
in this sense. It wasn't conditional before you came to know Jesus because he loved us when we were a bunch of what? Sinners. Enemies is what the scripture says. Why would he love us any less when we're his kids and we fall down and skin our knees? Or we start worrying? Or we start acting like Martha and take our well-being from the things that we do instead of who I am? You see, he simply says, abide my love. And he proved his love to us. The Bible says, no greater love does a man have than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for us. He proved it on Calvary's cross. Paul, writing about this, says, Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Yes, we have to, to be obedient. Yes, we have to be, uh, know Him personally. But we must rest in His love. We must never allow ourselves, listen, to drift away from Calvary. We need to see our life in light of the cross and His great love that was poured out on us. How He loved us. Remaining in Christ's love comes to the very point of what it means to abide in Christ. Simple obedience rendered to Him, guys, listen, is the fruit and the evidence of our love for Him. That's what He says. That's how He directs us. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you slaves because the master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father has told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that my Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my commandment. Love. Love each other. Love each other. The fruit that we're called and even commanded to produce can only happen when we're truly connected to Christ, when we're truly abiding in Christ. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. And when we think of fruit that He's asked us to bear, it's easy to go to Galatians 5, 22 and 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with His passions and His desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. We go there and we think of those things. And listen, really what, this, what the Holy Spirit is producing in us through love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness... It's producing the character and the life of Christ lived out in everyday living. Producing the character of Christ. Listen, you cannot take on the character of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit without taking on the mission of Christ. I love it when I get those dear saints that come and they're holier than thou and they tell me how spiritual they are. And you ask them, when's this last time you served? Oh, uh, uh, I'm too old for that. I've already done that. We tend to live with by checking boxes off. When was the last time you discipled anybody? Oh, I, I no. When was the last time you were in a Bible? Oh, oh, no. It's like, really? When was the last time you led anybody to Jesus? Listen, if we're going to take on the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to take on the mission of Christ. Because see, Christ came for one reason. To give his life away as a ransom so that you and I could be made right with God. We are called to be his ambassadors. We're called to take on his mission. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I now send you. We are called to take on this, this mission 
That the, that the gospel be preached to the ends of the world. That every tribe, every tongue. I can tell you why Jesus hasn't come back, guys. How many want to see Jesus come back in the next 10 years? Anybody besides me? I want him next six months, okay? A couple things I'd like to get in order and take care of, but... Listen, I can tell you why it hasn't happened, because we haven't preached the gospel to the ends of the world. It's true. The church become complacent. Saddest thing, saddest thing is an American Christian is now the world sending missionaries to us. We're not the number one sending mission group. Listen, we have to connect. We have to grow. We have to serve. And if we take any part of this out, we're failing to be obedient. We're failing to remain. This is something we all do. We never get too old. We never get too, too much knowledge. We never get too much whatever. You see, my goal, guys, is no longer... I, I, I'm not going to try and make any converts to Christianity. Serious, I want you to know that. Your pastor's done making converts. Okay, converts are like, you know, uh, some of you guys in this last uh, couple weeks have become Patriots fans. Some of you became Rams fans. You converted over. You left your old team so you could root on. Super. Listen, converts wear the hat and the jersey on one day a week. We're not called to make converts. People who bought fire insurance. We're called to make disciples. Committed followers of Jesus Christ that will connect with God first and foremost and connect with His body. It's called fellowship and help our community and others connect with Jesus Christ throughout the world. Disciples will grow in their knowledge and their application of God's Word, asking others to join in the journey. You see, we made knowledge in the church about, you know, I picked on Stephen uh, in Gateway this morning because Stephen understands Greek and Hebrew. That's what we think is knowledge. He's qualified to do anything and everything. Listen, Stephen is no more qualified, okay, to do anything in the church than anybody else just because he knows Greek and Hebrew. Okay? What qualifies us to, to do anything in the church is our servant's heart. We wash people's feet. The Holy Spirit will qualify us and fill us and give us the knowledge that we need. Listen, we'll serve. We'll follow the example of Jesus by discovering our spiritual gifts and serving each other in the world. That's what disciples do. Listen, and we will remain in Christ that we will take, the likeness, take on the likeness of Christ and carry out the mission of Christ. That's what disciples do, guys. That's who He's called us to be. That we would connect with Him and connect others to Him. That we would grow in our relationship with Him and ask others to take the journey. Listen, everybody should have somebody that they're connected to. Somebody ahead of them and somebody behind them. Two people should be in your, everybody's life. Where I look to someone to help disciple me and, and someone behind me that I'm saying, hey, let's go on this journey. Some of you have been on my spiritual journey for over 20 years. Okay, I mean, if I had asked Bill, he'd tell, and LaDonna, I'm not the same guy 20, I was 20 years ago, am I? No. Uh-uh. I hope you're not either. Listen, as a body, we're going to commit ourselves to this. We're going to serve our community. And as we look on the, on, the, on the web page, it'll be up and you'll be able to download it on your phone. You can draw this on a napkin. But in each one of those areas the, the, where it says discover training and mission, if you click on it, it goes through some things that we do corporately. And then it also does, goes through some things that are like, you know, connect your backyard, your, kit, your dining room table. 
Because see, some of it's corporate that we do. Some of it's individual that we do. As as we move forward as a congregation, not just in the next year. Listen, I hope that we can preach it to the end of the world in the next year and Jesus comes and it's all over, okay? I'm ready for 75, 80 degrees. Anybody else besides me? But it's when we commit ourselves to Christ that this happens. Because if we're committed to Christ, listen, we'll connect. We'll connect with each other and the world. If we're committed to Christ, we will serve each other and the world. If we're committed to Christ, we'll grow in our knowledge and our application of His Word. As we're going to, every message is going to have a connection to this. And if I forget to tell you, please tell me. Shout it out in the middle of the sermon. I don't care, okay? Where's this fit? Because we need to connect it to everything that we do. I'm excited about what this year has to bring in the years to come. There's some exciting things on the horizon that I, I can't yet let out of the bag, but I mean, it's blow your mind what God is doing and the opportunities that are before us. And I keep asking, Lord, why? And he keeps reminding me, hey, it ain't about you. Just follow. Just follow that we would become like Jesus and take the good news to the end of the age.